Hello, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 21 from Conceptual Physical Science, 6th edition. In this chapter, we're going to talk about plate tectonics and Earth's interior, so all about the physical mechanisms that drive the shape of the Earth. Now, this chapter follows from Chapter 20. In chapter 20, we talked about different types of minerals and how those minerals form different types of rocks and what distinguishes these types of rocks. It was very much about classifications of those minerals and rocks, and also it was a segue. It was a transition from all those content, all those chapters about chemistry, moving over to the study of geology. Well, now we're really getting well into geology, diving into the mechanisms of that field of scientific study. Okay, so we're going to start by thinking about earthquakes and seismic waves. Then we'll talk about the layers, what distinguishes the different layers of the earth. We mentioned them in passing in the previous chapter, the core, the outer core, the mantle, and the crust. But honestly, our focus was mostly on the crust because we were talking about minerals and rocks that humans interact with. But here we'll talk about more of what is going on and is the theorized to go on deeper inside the earth. Then we'll talk about this fascinating process that is unique to Earth within, within our own solar system. And that's, it. that's the idea of plate tectonics, which is the idea that continents move as well as ocean plates move, shifting the shape of the Earth. And that's changed over hundreds of millions of years. And that takes us, of course, to the very theory of plate tectonics. Because for a while, people didn't believe in it, as recently as 200 years ago. But now we certainly see dramatic evidence that the, the Earth is constantly shifting, and continents like North America exist on these tectonic plates. Okay, so very fascinating topic. And then we'll talk about the continental evidence for plate tectonics. How do we see this evidence? What's the story that plate tectonics tells, and how is that story reflected in things like evolu evolutionary biology or the existence of certain mount mountain ranges and climates, as well as the record of changes in climate as we dig down into the ground? Okay? So, starting with earthquakes, because if we're going to talk about the earth moving on the dramatic scale of giant plates sliding relative relative to each other at fractions of a millimeter per year, well, we also have to talk about the other motion that occurs on the earth, where suddenly, sometimes, there's a big release of energy, and the earth shakes very dramatically for a short amount of time in a fairly localized area, because that's, of course, what earthquakes are all about. But earthquakes are about releasing of energy that got trapped in these moving plates. Well, anyway, let's get to it. So, when rock under the Earth's surface moves or break, energy travels in the form of seismic waves. Okay, that's an earthquake wave, but the technical term is seismic wave. These cause the ground to shake and vibrate, which is a manifestation of that energy at the surface. That's an earthquake. Okay, so the energy travels as a wave through the solid of the crust. And then when it reaches the surface, it behaves as a shaking motion, an oscillation side to side, up and down of the surface, okay? Which of course causes cracks and landslides and all those effects, tidal waves. The analysis of seismic waves provides geologists with a detailed view of Earth's interior, okay? There's also a field of study um, which is seismology. So someone might call themselves a seismologist. They specifically study seismic waves and earthquakes. And this idea that we can use earthquakes not just as a dramatic example of the power of Earth and not just to be scared of them or try to predict them or try to um, make alarms a few seconds before they arrive, all important aspects of the study of earthquakes. We can also use them for direct benefit because by studying earthquakes, we can see how these waves travel through the Earth and that can literally tell us the composition of the Earth because there's only certain physical models that, ma that match the actual motion of those waves. Let me show you what we mean, okay? So the study of seismic waves has led scientists to understand that Earth is a layered planet, okay? So we could theorize it's a layered planet. We could base that on the, the actual dynamic behavior of Earth in space, its mass, the way, the way it rotates, but we wouldn't be that exactly sure about the thickness of the layers if it wasn't for seismic waves. It actually allows us to map out the interior of the planet the same way you can use radar to map out the things that are buried underground. Okay, you can you can have this these radar waves that bounce off of objects buried under the ground. You know, so that's that idea here, but these are much more powerful waves, thus they're penetrating very deep into the planet. Okay? And so the layers that we've been able to confirm exist due to measuring seismic waves are the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. 
okay? So in, in important differences between these different layers of the planet, especially considering what state of matter they're in, what phase of matter they're in. Some are liquids, some are solids, okay? So to talk a little bit more about the layers, let's make sure we understand what the seismic waves are all about, okay? Because it turns out that seismic waves, earthquake waves, come in two forms, okay? They come as what are called P waves, which are body waves, and then they come as surface waves as well, okay? Oh, let me, let me make this clear though. Body waves are, have two types. I said they're all P waves. Actually, there's P waves and S waves within the body waves, okay? Now let's focus on this. This is my main focus, actually, what I want you to focus on, body waves. They're the ones that travel through the interior of the planet, okay? So until it reaches the surface, this is how the energy is being transmitted through the solid rock of Earth's crust. The primary waves, P waves, are shown like this. Because notice the P waves are waves that involve regions of compression, so compression and stretching. Well, if you recall, and this is definitely a review of something we saw way back in our chapter on waves, if you recall a wave that behaves like this with the motion of the wave being parallel to those regions, it's the velocity shown there, oh, excuse me, so that's the velocity right there. So that with the motion of the velocity parallel to those regions of compression, compression and stretching, that means that primary waves, P waves, are longitudinal waves, okay? So very important type of wave that occurs with earthquakes, kind of like a pressure wave, like a sound wave. But there's also a different type of wave that travels through the interior of the planet, and those are secondary waves. And secondary waves actually involve the elasticity of the rock or the restoring force of gravity, and those are none other than transverse waves. Because as we can see, the actual displacement is perpendicular to the velocity, see? And that's what, of course, defines a transverse wave. So earthquakes have both longitudinal and transverse waves represented by P waves for longitudinal and S waves for transverse. But there's also other less important, to be honest, types of waves that occur on the surface. These are really more of just what we actually call the earthquake itself, the, sh the manifestation of the earthquake, the shaking that causes damage. And those are rally waves and love waves. And as you can see, one is up and down, which is the rally wave. And then the love wave is side to side. Okay. So primary waves are longitudinal. They compress and expand the material through which they move. I was just explaining that. Compression expansion occurs parallel to the wave's direction. Primary waves travel through any type of material, solid rock, magma, water, or air. We shouldn't be surprised that primary waves being longitudinal, airs, longitudinal waves can travel through something like air or water, which are both fluids, because clearly sound waves travel well through fluids as well. And for that matter, sound waves, also being longitudinal waves travel well through solids. We talked about that they're 20 times faster in steel than they are in air. Now, interesting thing is that that means that these types of waves will travel through any part of the earth, really, because they can, tra they can transition from a solid to a liquid. So different, different parts of the earth, those different layers have those different phases of matter. Well, this, these S waves, will, or excuse me, these P waves will just continue to travel. Primary, primary waves are also the fastest of all seismic, seismic waves, so they are the first to re register on a seismograph. Now, secondary waves are those transverse waves, up and down motion, which is perpendicular to the direction, perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Secondary waves only travel through solids. Liquids just don't have the elasticity and the defined form to actually create the restoring force that would, that would continue to propagate such a transverse wave. This fluids just move, just kind of move. They can compress, which allows for these types of longitudinal waves to travel through them. Fluids compress fine, but fluids don't really shear like solids do. They don't, they don't resist that side to side motion. Simply put, fluids don't have elasticity. Okay, so these transverse secondary waves, as I said, only travel through solids. They're simply unable to move through liquids. Secondary waves are also slower than P waves, and that's a, are the second to register, register on any seismograph for a particular earthquake event. So, as far as the surface waves are concerned, they are the slowest of all the seismic waves and the last to register because the energy has to reach the surface and then start to propagate along the surface. Rally waves have a rolling type of motion. They roll over and over in a tumbling motion, although usually the ground isn't literally tumbling over, but the tumbling motion occurs backwards compared to the wave's direction, okay? So think of it moving in this way, right, kind of as it goes along, okay? And the ground moves up and up and down as a manifestation of those circular structures rolling backwards as the energy dissipates along the surface. Okay?
Love waves, on the other hand, are have similar motion to S waves, except they have side-to-side -side motion. They're horizontal. They have whip-like side-to-side motion, which makes for things to shake side-to-side. -side. Earthquakes often have quite a lot of love waves in terms of the feeling you have of being shook inside to side and things falling over because of the earthquake. So the most destructive earthquakes are caused by the passage of surface waves because why? Because they travel faster? Is it because they occur in the crust? Is it because they occur at the surface, right, which causes it to shake up and down and side to side? Or is it because they travel so deep? Well, of course, it's simply because they travel at the surface. You know, we don't, we don't live deep underground, so the waves that shake things up deep underground don't have a direct effect on what we care about as being destroyed. That's the, the mountains and trees and buildings all around us. So, abrupt changes in seismic wave velocity reveal something. They tell us something really important. They tell us that we're at a boundary between different materials, okay? There's a well-defined boundary. This can use, be used at the small scale to study things like a large chamber of magma inside the Earth's crust, because of course magma is a fluid, it's gonna behave very differently. When a wave travels from the solid of the crust, like rock, into magma, it's going to refract because as the medium changes, so does the speed of the wave. Anytime speed changes, refraction occurs. That refraction can manifest itself in the direction of the wave and where that wave will get picked up by another sensor. This is all because there is a system of sensors, a grid measuring all this energy being bounced around the planet. So we can triangulate exactly where it's coming from and the path that waves take. Okay, so that's really, we can see those boundaries. We even create shaking, we can make, create smaller scale shaking such as a controlled explosion, and scientists will do that specifically if they need to send a wave somewhere. But earthquakes, but there are plenty of earthquakes every day, and their energy allows us to study the composition of the Earth. But also on a large scale, back to those layers, right? So the density of different layers can be estimated by studying the vari various seismic wave velocities. In 1906, so over 100 years ago, Richard Oldham observed that P waves, those primary longitudinal waves, and S waves, those secondary transverse waves, travel together for a distance. Then, when they encounter a boundary, then the S waves stop and the P waves refract. They refract because there's a speed change, okay, but they can continue. The S waves just can't, simply can't continue because the boundary was a solid to a liquid. He had discovered the core mantle boundary, a point where the core and the mantle met and this the change went from being a solid to a liquid. In 1909, just a couple years later, Andriha Mohorovic observed a sharp increase in seismic velocity at a shallow layer within Earth. Mohorovic had discovered the crust mantle boundary. And probably not as easy to measure, which is why the, the experiment and the the discovery came a couple of years later because here we basically have a solid to solid boundary, but still a significant change in densities because the mantle, although be, although it essentially is a solid, it's a very highly pressurized solid that actually behaves almost like a pseudo liquid where it's able to move very slowly in convection currents, even though for the most part it's a solid. So regard, my point being, it's not a clear cut case of going from solid to liquid, like from the mantle to the outer core, it's so instead from the crust to the mantle you're going from solid to different type of solid but because the density changes pretty dramatically because the crust really is that thin very different very light material with the silicate and the oxygen being much more common than in the mantle well then you have a clear case of waves refracting okay and in this case both the p wave and p waves and s waves would have refracted based on the measurements of mohorovic so that means that Earth is compo composed of a thin outer crust that sits upon a layer of denser material, the mantle. In 1913, continuing with this study, this was obviously a decade of a lot of discovery in, uh, using seismic wave measurements, Benno Gutenberg refined Oldham's work by locating the depth of the core mantle boundary at exactly 2,900 kilometers. And to put that into context, the radius of the Earth is 6,300 kilometers. So we can see it's a little less than half the way down. When P waves reach this depth, they refract so strongly that the boundary casts a P wave shadow where no waves are detected over part of the Earth because the refraction means that certain spots this can never be reached. If we consider an epicenter conveniently placed at the North Pole and we consider the directions of P waves and S waves, we can learn a whole lot about the composition of Earth's layers at this large scale. So let me actually zoom in on this picture. Okay, and just to be clear, this upper picture shows what we're doing in terms of the cutaway with our convenient earthquake epicenter. By the way, epicenter just means location of earthquake, but the earthquake occurring right there at the North Pole. So we have a really clear cut diagram, okay? And we can see those waves traveling down the different parts of the world, including over here near Australia and New Guinea and so on. 
okay? So now let's look in more detail at those wave paths. So the waves travel in all directions. These waves, when the, when the, earth, when the event has happened and, and energy is released, the waves are simply the mechanism to transmit those energy, that energy, and it travels in all directions. Of course, once it reaches the surface, things change because the this, you know, the solid ground to air interface is a really big change from, from a very high density solid or relatively high density solid to a very low density liquid. So in a fluid rather as a gas. So you really have no transmission of energy into the air. Thus you have those, those love waves and rally waves we talked about as surface waves. But point being, we care about the interior. We care about the primary and secondary interior waves. So we look, they're going in all directions. Right? Some, will tra some are essentially traveling straight down towards the outer core. Others are traveling off at different angles. So those are going to continue off. And those that don't touch the boundary between the mantle and the outer core will just continue on their way, reaching locations as far south from the North Pole as 105 degrees. So south of the equator, in other words, because 90 degrees would be the equator right there. Now, what's interesting, however, if you look at the S waves, well, you see that the S waves represented in white don't travel anywhere inside the outer core. You simply don't see any white waves because they can't travel through the outer core because the outer core is a liquid. But the P waves do represent as the black lines, but you notice the dramatic amount of refraction. That's because of the dramatic change in density and just composition of the material because of the different phase. And so then we see that the wave refracts very significantly and then refracts again. Due to that refraction, there is a shadow, in this case relative to our particular epicenter at the North Pole, between 105 and 140 degrees, where no waves reach. S waves, because they can't, can't travel to a liquid, don't go there, and the P waves don't go there because of the two points of refraction be between the two interfaces of the mantle and the outer core. Furthermore, we can recognize the existence of the inner core because of further refraction, because the inner core is in fact a solid due to the very high pressure at the center of the Earth. And we see that manifest itself in this very dramatic then secondary refraction and returns to the mantle and these fascinating um, pattern of waves at the other pole, right? A little more complicated than simply the shadow between 105 degrees and 140, but still a measurable pattern down here at the other core, okay? Or the other, other side of the planet, the other pole, not the other core. There's only one core, okay? So quite a story to be told there, and hopefully that figure makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of information there, okay? So continuing with our historical dialogue, in 1926, Sir Harold Jeffries determined that the core or part of it must be a liquid. Taken together, the discoveries of Oldham, Mohorovich, Gutenberg, and Jeffries indicate that the earth is composed of three layers of different composition, the crust, the mantle, and the core. Furthermore, in 1936, Inge Lemon observed that P waves also refract at a certain depth within the core itself. Of course, what's that? That's the inner core. At this depth, P waves show an increase in velocity, indicating a higher density material. So it actually increases in density as you go deeper in. Again, that makes sense based now on our modern models about the, the inner core just being so compressed by all the gravity or the weight of everything above, compressed from the force of gravity, making that high density inner core. Okay? Lemon discovered the inner core. The core has two parts, a liquid outer core and a solid inner core. Okay, very high temperature, so you think beyond the melting point of metals, but then return back to a solid because of the high pressure. Essentially, the inner core, it's a battle between pressure and temperature, and pressure won. Thus, the state is a solid. When added to earlier findings, Lemon's work completed the current picture of Earth's internal layer structure, and that model has remained basically refined but significantly unchanged since 1936. The core is composed predominantly of metallic iron. Okay, the core has those two layers, a solid inner core and a liquid outer core. The inner core is solid due to the great pressure, as I said a couple times. The outer core is under less pressure, and so the temperature wins, and thus it flows into a liquid phase. Okay, still highly pressurized, certainly, but so hot that, in, in just based on the particular dynamics, it is a fluid. Flow in the outer core produces Earth's magnetic field, right? Because it's essentially a giant dynamo. It's movement of charged particles that are, because of all the churning, they're able to stay charged. In other words, lots of ions. And then as the Earth rotates, those ions spin in a circle, which essentially creates a circular current. If you remember from our chapter on electromagnetic induction, a circular current creates a magnetic field. So there you go. We essentially have a dynamo, a circular current created in the outer core of the planet the liquid outer core. If the, if the outer core was not liquid, we would probably, based on our models of how magnetic fields are created for terrestrial planets like Earth, we simply would not have a strong magnetic field or maybe not at all. Although there is a lot of ongoing research about how magnetic fields are created.
The mantle makes up about 82% of Earth's volume and 65% of Earth's mass. Okay, so the mantle is a big deal. It's like it's so much of the world. The mantle, right, and that's, that's the part outside of the core, by the way, the mantle is Earth's thickest layer by far with a thickness of 2,900 kilometers from top to bottom. The mantle is rock rich in silicon and oxygen, much like the crust, okay? It also contains heavier elements, which is somewhat unlike the crust, such as iron, magnesium, and calcium. At least it has more than the crust does. The mantle is divided into two regions, okay? And these don't really get talked about as much, but technically speaking, there is the upper mantle and the lower mantle. What differentiates the two? Well, the upper mantle has two zones, the asthenosphere and the lithosphere. The lower part of the upper mantle is called the asthenosphere because the asthenosphere is solid but behaves in a plastic-like manner. That's what I was talking about where it's that pseudo-solid. It's a kind of solid, meaning that it allows it to flow easily. So it's just a very, very sticky fluid or a very, or a very soft solid, depending on how you think about it. The constant flowing motion of the asthenosphere greatly affects the surface features of the crust. It allows the crust to be moved along as the asthenosphere slowly churns in big circular motions of being a kind of solid, kind of liquid. It carries the crust with it and the crust then it carries as these big chunks that rub and crash into each other. The upper mantle also has the lithosphere. Okay, the lithosphere is includes the uppermost part of the upper mantle. Okay, so the very top, the lithosphere is cool and rigid because it's closer to the surface, just not as much heat there. Because the general rule is, as you get further away from the outer core, you have less temperature. Okay, it does not flow, but instead rides atop the plastically flowing asthenosphere, the lower part of the upper mantle. Okay, I know it's kind of confusing. Upper mantle has an upper and lower, but that's the way it is. Okay uppermost being clear there. Because of its brittle nature, the, the, the lithosphere is broken up into individual plates. Ah, see, now we're getting to the plates that the crust rides on. Movement of the lithospheric plates cause earthquakes, volcanic activity, and deformation of rock, such as the creation of mountain ranges. Okay, now what about the lower mantle? Well, the lower mantle extends from a depth of, depth of about 700 kilometers all the way to the outer core. So certainly the lower mantle actually makes up more of the mantle than the upper mantle. But the lower mantle is under great pressure, making it just a plain old solid. So actually it's quite uninteresting, or at least has less dramatic effect on our lives being surface dwelling creatures than the upper mantle. But maybe there's some mysteries to be revealed yet about the lower mantle. But what about the Earth's crust, that very thin layer on the top, which we talked about a little bit in our previous chapter? Well, there's, there's the oceanic crust, and there's also the continental crust, so two types of crust. The oceanic crust is composed of dense basaltic rocks, okay, and is compact with an average thickness of about 10 kilometers. On the other hand, the continental crust is composed of less dense granitic rocks and varies in thick thickness between 20 and 60, so quite a bit thicker, right? So again, you can think of the oceanic crust as being really thin and, thin and strong, and the continental crust being less strong, less dense, and much thicker. Right, so you can clearly see really well defined layers of evenly thick, thin oceanic crust and then big chunks of con continental crust. Okay. The word isostasy is derived from the Greek words iso meaning equal and stasis meaning standing. So the Earth's interior layers have this isostasy. So what is that? It essentially means they're in equilibrium or they're balanced out. Isostasy is the vertical positioning of the crust so that the gravitational and buoyant forces balance each other out in none other than equilibrium, something we made a big deal about back in our chapters on physics. The lower density crust or low density crust therefore floats on the dense underlying mantle. It's literally like a raft floating in water, but of course at a much slower time scale and on with some different densities involved. So why are the continents high and the oceans low? Well, it's all about isostasy. The variations in the surface elevations result from the variations in the thickness and the density. So the, the, the continental plates are like a big piece of styrofoam that's floating in the water with a lot of it above the water level, whereas the continent or the oceanic plates are like some like a big like a board that's barely floating in the water, evenly placed with just a little bit sticking above. Okay, so that's kind of, if you think about why, there's, why the continents stick up higher, it's because they're lower density and they're bigger thickness. So the areas of the continental crust stand higher than the areas of the oceanic crust because the continental crust is both thick and less dense. Okay, thicker and less dense than the oceanic crust. Again, styrofoam versus wood. All right, styrofoam's continental crust, wood is the oceanic crust.
The Earth's crust is thicker beneath a mountain because A, the roots of the mountain are heavier than the mountain at the surface. Is it because the mountain B is sink, sinks under the uh, upward buoyant force balancing the downward gravitational force? Is it C, because the, mon the mantle rock is weaker there beneath the, uh, beneath the mountain? Or is it D, because the oceanic crust is thin? Well, it's B. It's because the mountains sink until the upward buoyant force balances the downward gravitational force, okay? That's what makes it so thick. It's a balancing out. The mountains were created by pushing together or stacking up, kind of rolling up of material. And therefore, as that material builds up, gets pushed up, compressed up, it's then, it then sinks down as well as gets pushed up until it balances out. So you can think of a mountain as almost being reflected on the bottom side into the upper mantle below, because the mountain, of course, is part of the crust. So Alfred Wegener in 1818 and 1930 came up with a theory based on this idea of the continents, the way they looked, how they might piece, they might fit together as puzzle pieces, and came up with a hypothesis of continental drift, which was laughed at at the time. He, he proposed that the world's continents are in motion and have been drifting apart into different configurations over geological time. So not like historical time of a couple thousand years or even tens of thousands of years, but instead tens of millions of years. He proposed that the continents were at one time joined together to form the supercontinent of Pangaea, which is the universal land, or that's what it translates to in terms of its, its Latin roots, the word. All right. So Wegener used evidence from many disciplines to support his hypothesis. He noticed that there is a jigsaw fit of the continents. He looked at fossil evidence from paleontologists. He looked at matching rock types from geologists. And he looked at structural similarities and mountain chains on different continents from, ge um, from geography um, studies and saw that they kind of matched up as well. And he also looked at paleoclimatic evidence in terms of what plants may have lived in different places as we look at the fossil record. In other words, plants that were fossilized, okay? And he, then he came up with some theory like this, that at some point in the past, Europe fit in with North America, South America fit in nicely of Africa, and all the continents, not exactly in this form, but in some shape like this, were all pushed together. So despite evidence to support continental drift, Wagner could not explain how continents moved because it does demand the question, what's, what's the energy that's driving something as huge as continents moving over time? Therefore, without a suitable explanation, Wagner's ideas were dismissed. That's what I said, they were laughed at. However, detailed mapping of the seafloor revealed that huge mountain ranges exist in the middle of ocean basins. These deep trenches alongside some continent, as well as deep trenches alongside, alongside some continental uh, margins. So these discoveries made as technology improved and allowed us to map the bottoms of oceans by bouncing radio waves off of them, it really then led some greater credence to Wegener's theory. Because why would there be these deep trenches? And certainly what, what, what happens because these mountain ranges continually being, continually being created in the centers of oceans and the center of ocean basins? Well, maybe that could be the driving force of continental drift. So the deepest parts of the ocean are near the continents and out in the middle of the ocean, the water is relatively shallow, okay? So we see that in the middle, near the mid-ocean ridge, the Atlantic Ocean is a great example of this, but the Pacific Ocean also has a mid-ocean ridge. And along this mid-ridge, or more than one, along this mid-ridge, we can see it's more shallow, and then it gets gradually deeper, stays the same depth for quite a while, and then gets deepest at the trench when the ocean, oceanic plate meets the continental plate. So Harry Hess hypothesized that the seafloor was spreading, and that provided the mechanism for continental drift. So now we have some, some science to back up Wegener's theory. So the seafloor is not in fact permanent, it is constantly being renewed because new upwelling of material from the mantle is then solidifying, becoming new crust. All right, so the mid-ocean ridges are those sites of new lithospore, lithosphere formation. The oceanic trenches are the sites of the lith lithosphere destruction as they get subducted or pushed back down and remelted. Okay, in this somewhat fluid part of the uppermost part of the upper mantle. So the seafloor spreading is supported by magnetic studies of the ocean floor. The lava erupted at the mid-ocean ridges is rich in iron. The magnetic crystals align themselves to the Earth's magnetic field, and the Earth's magnetic pole flips 
every few hundred million years or a few, excuse me, a few hundred thousand years. And the North and, North and South Poles exchange positions, this is known as a magnetic reversal. And we can clearly see it in the crystals that are aligned with magnetic field and their switch over the record as we look further and further away. In other words, we have a measurement of time that shows us that as we look further away from the ridge, we're looking at older and older rock, which is totally supporting that idea that the, the ridge is all about continual creation, and then we have the plates sliding away in both directions. Okay, so this idea of looking at the crystals really supports that. The sea floor spreading is also supported by magnetic studies of the ocean floor, or I should say, further further explaining the supporting evidence of the magnetic studies of the ocean floor. The sea floor, the sea floor holds a record of Earth's magnetic field at the time the rocks of the sea floor cooled, because they cooled in alignment with the magnetic field. The magnetic record appears as parallel zebra-like stripes on both sides of the mid-ocean ridge. The age of the ocean floor and the rate of sea floor spreading can now be determined based on the reverse polarity and the normal polarity. So the rocks you know, align themselves in one direction. Once the pole switches, they align themselves in the other direction. And again, there's independent science or an independent model of how the magnetic field is created from the outer core of the planet that then we can say, well, then that 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 pole should switch at a certain time frame. It's an approximate time frame, but at least gives us some idea to measure millions of years since the time frame of pole switching is on the scale of hundreds of thousands of years, right? Okay. So plate tectonics is the unifying theory that explains this dramatic change of surface features on the Earth due to the movement of those crust plates, right? those lithosphere plates. Earth's, Earth's lithosphere is divided into eight large plates and some smaller ones. The continents move because they are embedded within the drifting plates. The plates are section, sections of Earth's strong, rigid outer layer, the lithosphere. The plates consist of that uppermost mantle and the overlying crust. So the plates themselves aren't all crust, nor are they all mantle. They are probably mostly mantle in terms of volume, that very, very uppermost part of the upper mantle, the lithosphere. And right on top of that is the actual crust, still distinguished from the lithosphere, although they're both solid and they're both rocky, but still some important differences between the two. And then so the crust is a thin thin layer that, fits, that uh, sits on top of the moving lithosphere plates. Okay, and the plates overlie and ride atop the weaker asthenosphere. And remember that the asthenosphere is liquid-like. Okay, it's the one part of the mantle that is really not in a solid phase. It's the part that is under, undergoing convection currents and moving around, okay, in that plastic-like sort of liquid, sort of solid state. Because, of course, as we go beneath the asthenosphere into the lower mantle, then we return to a solid, okay? So the eight major lithospheric plates, well, they are the plates that are in motion and continually changing in shape and size. The largest plate that there is on the planet is the Pacific plate, okay? Okay, and then the several plates include an entire continent plus a large area of seafloor. So they're not cleanly cut by, uh, by continents. Some of them certainly include seafloor as well. All right, and we can see these covered these color, uh, colored plates here. We can see that very, the largest of all, the yellow Pacific plate. We can see the North American plate over here, including a lot of seafloor um, as well as like Hudson Bay, for example, and the Caribbean. But then the Caribbean has parts of it, at least, including Florida. The Caribbean is one of those minor plates. We also have the very large South American plate, and you get the idea as we can continue through these names. But you can see that the sites of plate-to-plate -plate contact are where earthquakes are going to occur. And where you see these arrows pointing out, this is the creation of new seafloor crust by those mid-Atlantic ridges. We can see that some are mid-ocean ridges. The one I was first circling are the mid-Atlantic ridge. But we can see other examples of expanding seafloor crust happening at multiple ridges within the Pacific, all around the Pacific plate. Okay? All right. Very cool. So the Earth's plate move in different directions and at different speeds. The continental plates tend to move slowly. The oceanic, oceanic plates tend to move more faster. So that means that the different rates cause some interesting effects like buckling and so on. So the continental plates tend to move slower than the oceanic plates. Why? Why do you think it is? Is it because their roots extend deeper into the mantle? Is it because they're simply heavier? Is it because they are convergent? Or is it simply because of gravity? Well, it's all because of their roots extending further into the mantle, essentially meaning they have more drag. So, the, continuing with the theory of plate tectonics, we can say that interactions between plates occur along plate boundaries. That's where we look for interactions. What do interactions mean? They mean releases of energy. What do releases of energy mean? P waves and S waves. In other words, earthquakes. The creation and destruction of lithosphere occurs along those plate boundaries. And I guess we shouldn't forget volcanoes as well, right? 
Earthquakes, volcanoes, and the secretion of mountains occur, occur along those plate boundaries, and sometimes along former plate boundaries. We have divergent plate boundaries, we have convergent plate boundaries, and we have transformed fault, fault boundaries. What are those? Well, divergent is where magma is generated and the lith and lithosphere is formed. Those are like the mid-ocean ridges. Convergent plate boundaries, on the other hand, is where magma generation and, lith and lithosphere destruction. Okay, so this is like where the ocean, the ocean crust or the ocean plate is driven underneath a continental plate and is melted. That's the lithosphere destruction. A transformed plate involves no magma generation or formation or destruction of lithosphere. It's just one plate sliding against another or crashing into another. So plates move away from one another. As plates move apart, a cenosphere rises and partially melts to form lava. The new crust is formed as the lava fills in the gaps between the plates. Right? New crust being formed due to that rising and cooling and solidifying. In the ocean, seafloor spreading creates the mid-ocean ridge. On land, continents tear apart, creating a rift valley. Okay, There are examples of rift valleys like in northeast Africa. And these types of boundaries create shallow earthquakes that aren't particularly powerful. On the other hand, we can have convergent boundary features because, by the way, those were divergent. But with convergent boundary features, we have plates moving towards each other, such as the oceanic crust being destroyed and the continent, continental crust being deformed up above. This creates deep earthquakes that sometimes are so deep that they don't create too much energy by the time they get to the surface, but certainly have the potential to create a lot of earthquake energy, surface energy, that is. There's also oceanic-oceanic convergence. When two oceanic plates converge, the older and denser plate, only slightly more so compared to um, continental plates, but still the one will always be older and denser, will subduct above, uh, beneath the other. As the plate descends, partial melting of the mantle rock generates magma and volcanoes. If the volcanoes emerge as islands, a volcanic island arc is formed, such as Japan, the Aleutian Islands, or the Tonga Islands. So those are all examples of island chains being created by one oceanic crust subducting under another. Okay? And notice that Hawaii is not included because Hawaii is an island chain that's created by a hot spot, which is a whole phenomenon altogether whole different phenomenon. There's also oceanic continental convergence, where in this case, the oceanic plate is always the denser one, so it's going to slide underneath. It will subduct, because that's the term of sliding underneath, the less dense continental plate. As that plate descends, the um, oceanic plate, partial melting occurs of that subducting rock, which, of course, generates magma, liquid rock. The mountains produced by, by volcanic activity from the subduction of oceanic lithosphere and compression from the convergence are called continental volcanic art, um, arcs. The Andes are a great example of that, are, as are the Cascades in California. Continental continental convergence is where there's continued subduction that can bring two continents together. The less dense, buoyant continental lithosphere does not subduct. One does not clearly subduct under the other. Instead, there's just a straight up collision between the two and they just hit together, right? They just become continental blocks. The process then ha produces mountains because what's gonna happen is they crash into each other, they get pushed up. Of course, as they get pushed up, they also sink down due to that isostasy and balancing out of equilibrium of forces, but that creates large mountain ranges like the biggest on earth, the Himalayas, also the Alps and the Appalachians are all e examples of that at various points in geological history. So the continent to continent collisions of India with Asia produced and is still producing the Himalayas. Like I said, the biggest, mountain, biggest mountains on earth. These are the sites of the deepest, strongest earthquakes that are measured on average. All right, furthermore, we can talk about transformed plates. Well, these are plates that slide past one another and with no new lithosphere being created or destroyed. Most transformed, um, most transformed faults join two segments of a mid-ocean ridge, and the transformed faults are oriented perpendicular to the mid-ocean mid ridge. This permits the plates to move from offset ridges, ridge segments and, the, and create shallow but strong earthquakes, and often with high frequency. So most transformed fault boundaries are located within ocean basins. However, a few actually occur on land, such as the famous San Andreas Fault for residents of California. All right? There are three types of stress caused by interaction between plate boundaries, compressional stress, tensional stress, and shear stress. Compressional stress just involves slabs pushing against each other. In, against each other. Ten, tensional stress involves slabs of rock being pulled apart, and shear stress involves slabs sliding against each other, creating all that frictional energy. Rocks respond to stress in three ways. They can have elastic deformation, 
which, which means they ultimately can return to the original shape, brittle deformation, which results in breaking, or be turned into somewhat of a plastic state, which means they can flow like a liquid. In terms of the folds created by these plate interactions, we have syncline folds, where the layers tilt in towards a fold, or anticline, where they tilt away, as shown in the figure. Faults are classified by their relative direction of movement, which involve displacement. You can have footwall faults and hanging faults, as shown here. All right, footwall fault maybe creating a cave, and a hanging fault creating something like this, right? A big outcropping. All right. So in a strike-slip fault, blocks of rock slide past one another with very little vertical displacement. The San Andreas fault, again, is an example of a strict-slip strict slip fault. So which type of fault created the state of Nevada? Was it a reverse, normal, or strict slip? Strict, excuse me, strict slip, but it's strict slip. It was, in fact, a normal fault. As far as earthquakes are concerned, the plate tectonics model accounts for the global distribution of earthquakes. About 80% of the big earthquakes occur at subduction zones around the so-called ring of fire, which is largely around that Pacific plate and the other smaller plates attached to the Pacific plate or bordering the Pacific, Pacific plate. Earthquakes, well, an earthquake can occur on or between plate boundaries. It involves strain that begins at a depth as elastic deformation. And when that buildup of stress exceeds the, rocks, the rock's elastic limit, well, the rock breaks, the energy is produced, and that's how faults form. As far as earthquake measurement, there is the Richter magnitude scale that measures the ener energy released in terms of the ground shaking. This is determined from the logarithm of the amplitude of the waves recorded by a seismograph. A one unit increase on the Richter scale is actually a tenfold increase in amplitude. That's again because it's a log scale. We've seen log scales before with pH, where pH represent changes by multiples of 10 in the molarity concentration of oxide, okay, or hydroxide. The moment or the moment magnitude scale, another way to measure uh, earthquakes, measures the energy radiated from earthquakes focus. For one unit increase in magnitude, the seismic energy released by an earthquake actually goes up 30 times because it's basically just three times log. A tsunami is a, a, a great release of a sea wave that's created by a powerful disturbance that displaces the water column. Reverse fault earthquakes slip. Uh, thrust the seafloor upwards, so they're particularly prone to creating tsunamis. That huge displacement of mass, uh, displacement of a mass of water, drops back down to sea level, and that large wave is generated that travels to the ocean. Okay, well that brings us to an end of our study of plate tectonics and a lot of talk about earthquakes and seismology. I hope it has been interesting. Thank you so much for watching.